Hello everyone, how are you all? In this video, I am going to discuss about a brief history of hysterectomy procedure, pre-operative preparations, the surgical trolley makeup. We are also going to discuss about the instrument that are required for this surgery and also not to forget we will be discussing the very required post operative instructions to prevent any post operative complications before starting a video i am going to talk about something about the workshop itself the workshop is hands on hysterectomy In this workshop, you will be getting actual hands-on on the hysterectomy procedures. You will be doing actual surgeries under assistance of a very experienced surgeon who have an immense experience of more than 3000 surgeries by himself till now. You will be learning a very simpler but still a profound technique of hysterectomy established personally right to know about this workshop you just need to click on the link given in the description in once you click the link you will be forwarded to our website where <clears throat> you can see a various discuss uh, various discussion on this topic also you will be getting uh, uh, the details of the workshop where the workshop will be uh, organized and uh, you need to uh, fill a form the form of teleconsultation once you fill the form you will be getting a teleconsultation a free teleconsultation with our trainer and you will be discussing where you belong uh, a stage in this uh, immense uh, longer procedure or learning curve of surgery uh, of the surgery right so you will be uh, discussing what you already know and what you need to improve further for example some gynecologists are very confident in doing cesarean sections but they have no exposure of hysterectomies so at, at what point you are uh, stuck with and how you can improve in your further uh, surgical profile okay so this will be discussed along in, in during the free teleconsultation with our trainer right so you will be getting all the schedules of the uh, course uh, the fees of the course and uh, every details about it so uh, just go in the description and click on the link right so now <clears throat> uh, in this workshop we have a series of theory lecture before we actually turn to the actual practical workshop right so there are some six lectures theory lectures on this workshop the first one is pelvic anatomy surgical anatomy of pelvis that video the link of the video is given in the description you can just go and have this uh, mindset of uh, knowing the surgical anatomy of the pelvis first right this is our second video in this series in which we are learning pre-operative procedures and post-operative uh, procedures right in the third video there will be an actual actual uh, broadcast of uh, total abdominal hysterectomy procedure and you will be explained every step at the time right so just don't forget to watch that video also the third the fourth video will be actual vaginal hysterectomy procedure where you will be uh, learning the every step and just seeing that step how it is done in actual surgery right the fifth video will be discussing some financial requirements to establish your clinical setup right if you want to establish your own setup there will be what what are the requirements and where to get all the things this will be discussed in this fifth video and the sixth video will be some core tips directly from the surgeon who is running his uh, clinic since last four to five years successfully so 
these are the series of lectures first three videos will be free and will be uploaded on youtube for public uh, uh, view but the rest of the three video will be only uh, shared once you enroll into the course right so let's start this video now we are going to discuss about the hysterectomy uh, procedures right now see hysterectomy is the second most surgical procedure done all over the world what is the first one first one is the cesarean section so you know that that his learning hysterectomy is very important in your uh, professional life as a gynecologist right you must know the hysterectomy procedure because this is your one of the basic surgeries that you will be doing in your professional career right so now let's see about the history quick history we can see the reference of hysterectomy since 5th century right so isn't it amazing <clears throat> in 1600 ad there was a case paper that was presented and the descriptions of 26 cases of vaginal hysterectomies were there in this case paper so it is a very very old procedure okay initially initially what happened in older times they used to do only vaginal hysterectomy right so vaginal hysterectomy is the first hysterectomy that was done at that time then people started doing abdominal hysterectomy and in today's life the laparoscopic hysterectomy is also very famous right so let's see uh, something about uh, some data from the t land itself that worldwide comparison of hysterectomy technique so how the hysterectomy is being done there are basic three techniques abdominal vaginal and laparoscopic so if you see about usa united states there is a wide difference if you see in those different states okay so in uh, in california you can see that 71% of the hysterectomies are of abdominal technique 25% are of vaginal technique and only 4% are done by laparoscopic surgery now if you see this data may be uh, vary with the time but uh, these data actually represent that how people doing hysterectomy over the world right and uh, if you see a one state of minnesota in this uh, state you can see that 56% of the hysterectomies are done vaginally so here and only 44% for abdominal so you can see here that vaginal hysterectomy is being done more than abdominal hysterectomy if you see about uh, the europe that is england finland denmark where you can see that uh, the the amount of hysterectomy done by abdominal route is more okay and very important data around about the finland you can see here the 24% of the hysterectomy is done by the laparoscopic route and only 18% is done by the vaginal route so there are different different trends in the world now what are the indications for hysterectomy that in which cases you will prefer hysterectomy see the indications of the hysterectomy are not clear cut okay because uh, you know uh, previously what used to happen is we had a minimum amount of drugs available or the hormonal knowledge we have availab uh, available at that time when we can just treat some minor dysmenorrhea with the hormonal treatment right at that time we don't uh, we 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 didn't have those estrogens and progesterone uh, uh, as a medicines right so at that time the at that time the tendency to go for hysterectomy for simpler indication was there but in today's life it's not like that first you have to manage any problems medically then only if you think that you can uh, if you think that then only you should go for the surgical procedure of removing the uterus okay let's say let's talk about abnormal bleeding so abnormal bleeding is a one of the commonest 
uh, reason for hysterectomy right so what happens actually abnormal bleeding can be managed medically but sometimes the doctor even uh, even after managing this abnormal bleeding since six to seven months and still it is not controlled and then they go for the hysterectomy so what i am trying to tell you here is you must have the justification of doing hysterectomy uh, instead of uh, why not to treat it medically first right so these are the uh, uh, indications like abnormal bleeding leomyoma adenomyosis endometriosis pelvic organ prolapse pelvic inflammatory disease chronic pelvic pain pregnancy related conditions malignant diseases like neoplasia cervical endometrial ovarian right so in this uh, cases also the hysterectomy is commonly being done now the fundamental question which approach is better so there are a lot of discussion in this topic that uh, different different gynecologists have different views of uh, of the different techniques so uh, which approach is better there are two aspects of discussing this topic. The first one and very important is good for patient. Which technique is good for the patient herself? Don't think about the doctor. So if you think about patient, then the vaginal hysterectomy is more comfortable to the patient compared to the abdominal hysterectomy. Right. But if you if you see about doctors that which technique is a, a, a good or a simpler to learn uh, that in that case it will be most of the doctors will tell you TAH that is total abdominal hysterectomy because TAH is little bit uh, uh, easy to do and uh, uh, and you can see the all uh, you know uh, pedicles uh, when the uterus is removed you have different pedicles left inside your abdomen that are of uterine artery uh, ligaments and the fallopian tubes and all so uh, in the abdominal hysterectomy you actually can view uh, these pedicles before closing down so the risk of post operative hemorrhage or intra abdominal hemorrhage is very very decreased right so generally what happens for the gynecologist the newer gynecologist they find to do TAH more easy than vaginal hysterectomy right but once you experienced well in vaginal hysterectomy then you might find VH or vaginal hysterectomy more easier than TAH so this depends totally on the gynecologist right Now, uh, uh, to confirm the hemostasis, TAH is comparatively quick. The visual field provided in total abdominal hysterectomy is more than vaginal hysterectomy. You can also diagnose the other organs too, right? So, going intra abdominally or doing the TAH, you have a chance to view the abdominal organs too. For, so, for the diagnostic diagnostic purpose, you should go for TAH then VH, right? There are easy techniques also. Now, now let's uh, uh, let's uh, discuss about a rule, a undefined rule or a unsaid rule. That means when you are uh, a newer gynecologist, then you should start learning total abdominal hysterectomy first because it it is more easier and more definitive procedure until unless you haven't done 50 TAH you should not go for vaginal hysterectomy right once you do your first 50 surgeries then you should look forward uh, to go for a vaginal hysterectomy right because vaginal hysterectomy is a, a little bit blinder procedure a blind procedure than the TAH so I would advise you to go at least 50 TAH before going to the vaginal hysterectomy and once you have done a 50 vaginal hysterectomy 
then only you should go for the laparoscopic approach so if you want your uh, if you want to expertise uh, if you want to have your expertise in laparoscopy in future then also learning this approach is first will help don't just jump to the laparoscopic hysterectomy right because it is very very uh, it's very very uh, risky procedure to do first if you are thinking about doing laparoscopic hysterectomy because any time complication can happen and at that time you have to convert your laparoscopic hysterectomy into an abdominal hysterectomy so it is always better to start with the abdominal hysterectomy first then go for the vaginal hysterectomy then go for the laparoscopic approach if you have done i think 50 50 both tah and vh then you will be finding very easy to learn the laparoscopic approach right now Uh, there are uh, there are general rules about when the TAH is preferred over VH. So if the uterus size is more than 12 week, then it's easy to remove it by this abdominal technique. Whenever you are not sure about the adnexal mass or something different or some tumor kind of thing or some solid mass in the pelvis, you just can't go for vaginal hysterectomy because in that case you will be not able to see by your naked eyes what are the other structures in the abdomen where are the adhesions and you may lose diagnosing the very critical condition of the patient and at that time uh, it will be not good for patient and for you also so in this kind of uh, if you are not sure of diagnosis go for TAH then VH Sometimes what happens, the cervix is so large that you or hypertrophied that in that case, if you go for vaginal hysterectomy, you just can't really identify the ligaments and you just can't really tie up the ligament before releasing the cervix, right? So it must, it, it becomes difficult in this case of hypertrophied cervix or large cervix. If there is no prolapse at all or if the uh, uterus is very very strictly or stoutedly you know fixed in the pelvis then in that case also doing vaginal hysterectomy is little bit uh, a problematic thing so go for TEA, TAH in those cases right sometimes what happens the pelvic is unfavorable that means the the room for doing vaginal hysterectomy is not that much uh, comfortable at that time also you should go for abdominal hysterectomy right now so these were the discussion about which approach is good right so whenever you don't know anything go for TAH right <clears throat> then let's uh, discuss about the pre of work off of the patient okay so you have diagnosed a patient and you have decided that you are going to do a hysterectomy whether by abdominal or by uh, vaginal before that you need to do certain test right the first one will be first one will be a uh, anesthetic uh, fitness for getting the anesthetic fitness most of the time the anesthetics wants a chest x-ray of the patient a ECG of the patient if the patient is uh, of more than 45 years of age then even uh, they want their cardiac workup to do also so they want a 2d echo uh, in which the cardiac function is assessed more uh, clearly needed by the uh, anesthetic people right you also need to do a CBC that is complete blood count and the into this complete blood count you need to focus on the hemoglobin whenever you go for a major surgery you must do the hemoglobin before right it must be more than 10 gram right and uh, whenever you go for a surgery you should also make a cross match 
of the blood group and you should be available with at least one blood bag okay when it is required generally if the hemoglobin is more than 10 then with an experienced surgeon you don't require the blood products but yes if your hemoglobin if the patient's hemoglobin is less than 10 gram then try to build that hemoglobin first then go for surgery or have your uh, blood products ready because it might need during surgery you also do a one single time left uh, lfts and kfts and also a sugar level rbs rbs is generally you know uh, not that much uh, specific for diagnosing the uh, glucose intolerance in those cases you need to go for the fasting blood sugar and it should be less than 110 right now blood group I already talked talk to you it is must be done a urine RM is very important because it defines you whether there are any urinary infection or not pap smear should be done right pap smear uh, should be done before going for the hysterectomy because in the pap smear you might find the various uh, carcinoma uh, uh, pre, -condi pre carcinous conditions and in those cases you might prefer to go for even larger or broad spectrum surgeries than just a hysterectomies ultrasound should be done a diagnosis on the basis of ultrasound that is a radiological investigation must be done before going to the actual surgery general examination of the patient must be done right you need to acquire the pre anesthetic fitness so if you are a surgeon you have to respect the anesthetic advice right because if you save the anesthetic before the surgery he will save you during the surgery this is a very very important advice to you just just don't forget the pre anesthetic uh, fitness and the anesthetics advice okay genuinely follow the anesthetic advice you will be safe the second thing is informed consent this is the very very important part on the paperwork of yourselves you should not go for any surgery or the patient should not enter into the operation theater before having a well informed consent and the patient must have signed it even patients relatives also have signed it right patient will never enter without the consent right and at the time of consent you should properly counsel the patient that why you are removing the uterus you should also make them uh, informed that yes you are removing the uterus and in future you you won't be able to pregnant or you won't be able to get menses monthly right so this thing should be uh, informed to the patient and the relatives what happens actually most of the time patient at this stage patient has understood already that what is going to happen after hysterectomy but still you must must inform even they know it uh, before only right so informed consent is very important now let's discuss about pre operative orders before preparing uh, or before taking the surgery patient must be prepared for the surgery and the first thing very important in doing the pelvic surgeries or even any gynecological gynecological surgery is to prepare bowel right because if the patient eats a too much or has eaten something just before the surgery the bowels will be not allowing you to have a good view of uterus and pelvic organs so you must must prepare the bowel it is very white it is very it is of very vital importance here okay that you should prepare your bow, uh, patient's bowel and how you will do that you will advise the patient a liquid diet on the day before surgery so the patient will be taking liquid diet only uh, a day before the surgery the patient should be kneel by mouth of at least 12 hours okay not even water should be taken the patient should undergo a enema in the morning okay this will uh, facilitate you 
to remove any fecal uh, material that is present in the bowel. So if you have well prepared the bowel, then the bowel will be uh, in the smaller distance and it will be uh, just shifting and giving you a good view of your surgical field. Now the parts preparation, shaving, of, shaving uh, at the in, incisional site is very important because it clearly decreases the risk of cellulitis and wound infection. Third thing is the very important thing is prophylactic antibiotics. Okay, what what generally every uh, what is followed in every hospital most of the time is giving the ceftriaxone one gram IV state thirty minutes before the incision after the test dose, right? Because ceftriaxone you must do a test dose or allergic uh, screening right and once you have got uh, the, the green light then you should be prepared with the ceftriaxone injection and you need to give the ceftriaxone injection before 30 minutes of the actual start of the surgery. Second choices of antibiotic can be also gentamicin and metronidazole. You should also uh, prehydrate the patient that by IV fluids, okay, to uh, to have a better uh, a better uh, you know uh, uh, generally what happens with the spinal anesthesia there will be a, a, a BP will be uh, lowering at that time. So if you have prehydrated the patient, then this problem will be lesser during anesthesia. Anyways. This hydration and all these things are well managed by the anesthetic people. So you don't need to worry about much about them. Now, so there should be a surgical checklist in which once the patient is being shifted into the OT, the, the file or the case paper should be along with the patient and, and the first paper should be of these three things. Basic consent check, the patient should have a consent. Patient's identity should be reconfirmed by the name by the registration number and sometimes even by the even by even by the uh, retinal checking and even you know uh, a thumb impression like that so in very very advanced surgical units there is a there is a criteria of checking the identity with the help of even retina and with the help of thumb impression also. But if you don't have those very advanced techniques at your uh, surgical setup, then you just need to reconfirm the identity by, uh, by uh, confirming the name and registration number. Right. The surgical site should be prepared. You should knowing that what surgery is going to be done. So what surgery is planned should be written in bold, uh, in very bold uh, fonts in front of the uh, uh, case paper of the patient, right? Because at this place only, at this time, the major surgical blunders happens and one patient, uh, another patient is being shifted and operation is being done on another patient and this can be a very devastating for your career. So never ever forget to recheck. Though it finds boring, but you have to recheck and reconfirm the identity before taking the patient into the operation theater, right? So you should train your staff or the nursing staff or the personnel who are doing this work to recheck. And don't forget to enter in the OT at the time when patient enters too, you must be uh, you must check by yourself only because if something happens, then you will be the responsible. The doctor will be responsible. So you must check this thing by yourself. Now, now we'll be discussing the trolley making. The surgical trolley is very important to know. What happens actually, uh, this trolley is prepared and maintained by the nursing staff, right? But you, again I told you, if something happens problem, uh, in, uh, problematic, then you will be responsible on the first hand, not your nursing staff. So you also must have the knowledge of 
how to prepare and how to make a surgical trolley right because sometimes what happens is uh, nursing staff are newer one or they are uh, trainees they don't know uh, exactly what to be uh, what to be there on the surgical trolley so just have that habit to check the surgical trolley before starting the surgery you must have the counts of instruments and mops before starting the surgery and you should recheck all the counts of instruments and mops after closing the abdomen or even sometimes before closing the abdomen there is there is a you know a, a proper method of checking the counting of surgical instruments and mops before closing the abdomen or closing the uh, rectus sheath just have that habit the smaller habits will be very very important in your further surgical life okay because there are very chances of miss some smaller mistake and you if you leave us even a simpler or smaller mob inside the abdominal cavity you will be held responsible right forget the surgical technique however good surgeon you are whatever surgeries you have done even you have done tens thousands of the surgery but he, but if you leave a small mop inside your patient or a small instrument inside your patient's abdomen that will be devastating for your career so this is a very prime importance that you should count everything on the surgical trolley before the surgery and at the time of closing the final abdominal wall right so let's discuss what are required instruments in the trans abdominal hist uh, sorry in the total abdominal hysterectomy <clears throat> this is a picture of surgical trolley the number one thing here described here are the are the drapings and towels okay drapings and cut sheet right so uh, second uh, second uh, instrument described here are the retractors these are also the retractors okay we will be discussing each and every retractor also right right so let's talk about the drapings and cut sheets drapings and cut sheets are the sterilized towels or linen okay they are very very initial very very useful uh, um, a prevention useful for prevention of uh, other exposure to the other parts of the body so what happens actually when the patient is on the OT table like this you need basically three sheets a two plain sheet and one cut sheet okay so this is a patient here the schematic diagram i'm talking about and you need to have three drapings okay the first will be like this the first drapping will be like this the sec the second drapping the first will be like this the second will be like this and the third draping is actually a cut sheet will be like this right so here there will be a cut and this is going to be your surgical field this thing so patient should be well covered with the drapings and only this only the in only the surgical site should be exposed and rest should be covered okay now let's talk about retractors something okay so there are uh, certain kinds of retractor but you need two or three only right the first one is uh, this retractor which is used to retract the skin and anterior abdominal wall so this is called doyen's retractor so you have i know you have seen this retractor but sometimes what happens if you if you are doing surgery with some experienced surgeons then the surgeon will tell you that give me the doyen's and at that time you are not knowing the actual name of the retractor that will be very embarrassing moment i thought 
so you must know the names of the instrument too because many surgeons have the habits of talking in names right so this is a doyen's retractor the second one is a divers retractor here is a divers retractor here is a doyen's retractor retractor this one is a Landon's bladder retractor so we have discussed three retractors the first one is a doyen's retractor second one is a divers retractor and the third one is a Landon's retractor bladder retractor now comes the another instrument that is called myoma screw myoma screw is very important because it helps you to particularly grasp a tissue which is going to be removed okay if you want to remove just a myoma then you just put this uh, instrument into that myoma and you will be holding the myoma very uh, in with a very very good uh, uh, very good grip right if you want to remove the uterus then also you can just put this myoma screw into the uterus also okay the fourth thing is a cautery this is a monopolar cautery. The electro cautery, uh, cautery are very important, very, very important in nowadays surgery because you know, even in the laparoscopic surgeries today, nowadays, most of the cutting is done by this electro cauteries or uh, let's say a very high ultrasonography, ultrasono energy. Uh, uh, things okay so here in the open surgeries we generally use is a monopolar monopolar cautery right there is another uh, uh, type of cautery that is bipolar cautery that also we will discuss when we use into that surgery but right now just remember this is a electrical monopolar cautery there are generally two buttons here the one is for cut and the second one is for coagulate when you press the cut the energy source will be higher side so it will just cut the tissue and when you press the coagulate one the energy level will be not that high so it will not just cut the tissue but instead it will coagulate the tissue right now the third one comes a very important thing is a hemostatic forcep hemostatic forcep or artery forceps are various type of forceps okay which are very very uh, which have a very good grip over the tissues okay let's say here it is a spencer wells clamp when we do a hysterectomy there is two terminology terminologies one is a clamp and one is a, one is the uh, uh, forcep so both are used interchangeably so you don't need to worry when the uh, surgeon calls you give me the spencer wells then you need to give this instrument which is also a clamp right it is also a clamp now the clamp can be straight and curved okay so you should have at least four clamps in your surgical trolley for such clamps in your surgical trolley okay if i talk about no numbers then you must have uh, uh, I, I already have talked about that you must have three uh, drapings with one cut sheet and you should have at least one one of this retractor each retractor okay you should be having this three retractor on your surgical trolley myoma screw sometime needed or sometime not needed but you should have this uh, uh, very important instrument you might require many a times a surgical cautery is a must you must have at least four hemostatic forceps or a spencer wells forcep okay uh, or clamps uh, curved clamps are used also and uh, you know straight clamps are also used but some people uh, some people like curved one right so this will be whatever which are good will be only decided by you when you actually go for the surgery the towel clip is also important mm -hmm. to hold the towels you should have at least four towel clips this is a kidney dish tray right so the kidney dish is very important to hold uh, the specimen that you cut out from the uh, cut out from the uh, you know uh, abdomen that may be uterus or there may be ovaries or there may, there may be some fluid also there is a small bowel in which you will prepare the 
iodine uh, providing iodine uh, uh, mixture right let's talk about mops mops are the actually a handkerchief kind of uh, uh, linen okay it will soak the blood it it is used to soak the blood and give the clear surgical view or field right it there should be at least four mops in every surgical trolley and counting of the mops is very important before starting the surgery you must have counted how many mops you are taking the one bowel we i have already talked along with the kidney dish you have that bowel with a small mop small kind of mops let's say uh, four by four centimeter of mops uh, made up of linen and uh, it uh, they are soaked with the betadine in that bowel that are used for painting now the empty bowel i already told you uh, you should have one empty bowel to to collect any body fluid if it is there the another thing is a needle holder needle holder is a very uh, identifiable instrument you should have at least two needle holder even it requires only one but you should have two needle holders in your trolley because sometimes what happens that uh, the needle holder just uh, drops on the ground and becomes unsterilized at that time uh, you must have one backup needle holder this is a sponge holding forceps very important to hold the sponge and to hold the larger uh, structures with lesser trauma even you can hold the small uterus or ovaries with this sponge holding forceps right so you should have at least one of this in your trolley surgical knife is very important uh, surgical knife you should have number 10 knife which is uh, generally considered as a universal number so you should at least have one surgical knife scissors there are two kind of scissors available that we use the first one here it is called myos type scissor this scissor is used for dissection and excision for example you want to cut the rectus sheath you will be using the myos type of scissor the second one is a very uh, is a more delicate one that is uh, the name is mezenbams and that is a tissue dissecting uh, uh, scissor it with with the help of this scissor you will dissect the tissue then the cutting cutting should be performed by more stronger uh, scissors that is myos type of scissor this is one more delicate kind of scissor to dissect the smaller tissues there are dissecting forceps both toothed and plain these uh, forceps are very important to hold the fascias and the uh, tissues right so you should have at least one one of this kind of forceps in your trolley now comes the proper hemostatic forceps or artery forceps which are used which are very strong forceps right uh, like more mosquito forceps curved mosquito forceps straight like kind of you have already know this artery forceps okay the very important property of this artery forceps is the hold of this forcep is very very tight and very very secured so once you hold something with this uh, mosquito forcep and you have just done uh, three clamps here here is the catch procedure catch assembly so if you have just put uh, uh, that uh, you know catch clamp and cut so we used to call this uh, three uh, steps catch clamp and cut so once you have uh, reached the one or two uh, steps here then here the tip will be more and more strong so what is the what is the uh, property of hemostatic forceps is the blade if you see the blade the blade will be equally <coughs> stronger okay if i put a tissue here it will hold the tissue similar as here right so and it will just you know uh, fix it very well that the uh, the structure is hold with very a uh, strong and a very uh, a good grip right so these instruments are very important i know you already have used these uh, uh, instruments right so you should have at least two of this kind and two of this kind forceps uh, in your trolley another very important very important instrument the alice tissue holding forceps Alice tissue holding forceps is used 
to hold the fascias to hold the thick and strong fascias <coughs> you should have at least four alleys inside your trolley another one is a babcock's forceps that are used to hold softly the tubal structures okay even you can hold a bowel or even you can hold the fallopian tube and ovaries with these structures with very minimal uh, injury valsalum is a kind of a stronger alleys okay valsalum is a longer instrument it is used to hold the lips of the cervix anterior and posterior and it's very important very strong uh, instrument but you don't need much valsalums in your trolley at least one valsalum you should have and that is enough another thing that should be available in your trolley is a euro bag and foley's catheter because uh, most of the time what happens is you uh, many surgeons prefer to catheterize the patient be before starting the surgery and many surgeons prefer uh, to catheterize at the end of the surgery whatever the surgeon's preference is you should have that euro bag and foley's catheter so this was all about the uh, trolley making of the uh, uh, surgical procedures okay right now now let's talk about the post operative advices right once you have completed the surgery ideally what happens uh, there are certain tendencies of doctors that some doctors discharge the patient at on the post operative day 3 or 4 or some doctors discharge them at the 7th or 8th day of post operative procedure well this uh, this thing is dependent on the doctor's uh, doctor's decision i personally prefer that you should discharge the patient on day 3 or day 4 itself to cut the cost of hospitalization if you feel that everything is okay then you can discharge the patient on even day 4 right there should be a check dressing check dressing is very important which is done on day 3 or day 4 when you do the check dressing you will on, you also changing the bandage and you also uh, will be seeing whether the the skin incision or the skin sutures are okay or not they sh they should be uh, you know no there should be no pus and there should be no other things like uh, a boil or pus or kind of uh, you know uh, not fixed well uh, this all things you have to diagnose at the at the level of check dressing okay this will also help you to reapply the iodine povidine and anti anti in uh, you know uh, the disinfectant turns to the surgery to the surgical site so again check dressing should be done on the day 3 or day 4 antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics should be given for at least 3 days okay injection metronidazole ciplox that is ciprofloxacin rentec uh, uh rentec must be used that means uh, anti acidic right patient should be at least nbm for rest 8 hours right in those time you need to provide the iv fluids in proper amount uh, at least 3 to 4 fluids per day should be given if you are keeping the patient nbm okay on the next day on the next very day for example if you have done a surgery on uh, on the uh, at the 9 am in the morning then the patient should be patient should be nbm for next one day or 24 hours on the next day at 9 am you are going to ask the patient that whether she is feeling okay or not you will check for the bowel sounds why you check for bowel sound because once you do a surgery once you do abdominal surgery that will be considered as a injury to the bowel and once this injury of the bowel is happened okay we are not injuring the bowel at least but still we are handling the bowels even handling of the bowels will make the bowel in shock and they will be paralyzed so there will be no movement in bowels for uh, let's say some 3 4 hours at least so on the next day when you uh, when you see the patient you will check for bowel sounds if the bowel sounds are okay 
or uh, you will find that the moments of bowel is okay then you can start with a small liquid diet on that day okay once she is uh, able to take the liquid diet for 12 hours then you can fully shift her to the normal diet okay normal natural diet right that was about the dietary advice you should always do a hemoglobin repeat test on day 3 of the uh, surgery right to check how much uh, hemoglobin has been decreased generally generally with you know very smaller and very good uh, surgeon generally the hemoglobin fall is less than one right a suture removal should be done on either i think day eight right and uh, there are two types of suture there are staplers or simple uh, simple silk sutures anyhow you need to remove remove them on around day eight <coughs> right you can discharge the patient from starting from day 3 to day 5 right so uh, there is a one rule while discharging the patient you from the day 3 you should start asking the patient whether they want to go home or whether they are feeling okay they want to go home and uh, whether they uh, whether they are now okay with eatings and you know drinking waters and urinating well right so you should you should you know uh, tell the patient or ask the patient if the if your patient is okay with the discharge then only you can discharge the patient you cannot discharge the patient against the advice of the patient okay if patient doesn't want to get discharged you can't discharge the patient so this is a rule uh, one thing i think i forgot to tell you is the removal of catheter Okay, whatever anesthesia you give, right? It will be I it will be immobilize the patient for five to six hours at least. So for that five to six hours, the urine should be passed. Okay, and the patient will be not able to go and pass the urine. So you should put a catheter inside for next 24 hours after the surgery, and you can remove the catheter on next operative day. Okay, so you can remove the catheter and you can ask the patient that she should just you know uh, pass the urine or she should you know go uh, and uh, stand and uh, just pass the urine if she wants some patients are not uh, capable of uh, uh, capable of mobilizing on the second day only on those patients you can remove the catheter on the day three also Okay, so there are certain changes with this uh, and, and different to different with other doctors. So again, when you when you join our workshop, we will be taking care of all these things that you learn, okay, by ourselves. Now, uh, I think the video is uh, complete with this advice and we will meet on the third video, which will be actual, actual surgery going on. And every step will be uh, will be uh, will be clear to you at every stage. Okay, the video will be stopped, and you will be explained what we are doing, going to do. And the video will run then, and then the video will stop. We will explain you the next step. Then uh, again, video will run. So this uh, I have planned uh, the thing in this way. So uh, for now, uh, goodbye and have a nice day.